Hey, good morning, everybody. Dr. J here, and welcome to Chapter 2, Biology and Behavior. I want to go over two main ideas in this lesson. It'll be a short lesson to begin Chapter 2, and those are brain imaging techniques and how far we've come, especially in the past 30 years, and structure and function of the neuron. The neuron is the basic building block of the human nervous system. Let's get started. A student of mine many years ago asked me, what does the brain possibly have to do with psychology? Well, the brain has everything to do with psychology. Just think about this. Every thought and feeling and behavior you engage in can be broken down at a cellular level to chemical processes. You need a powerful microscope or brain imaging techniques to see this. Now, for most of human history, our knowledge of the brain and our understanding grew very slowly, if at all. But with the invention of the microscope a few hundred years ago, we be, it became possible to look at the brain a little bit more closely. And in just the past 30, 40 years, with non-invasive brain imaging technologies, our knowledge of the brain has increased dramatically. It has exploded. But even then, we are just barely touching the tip of the iceberg. We still don't know very much about the brain. But these brain imaging techniques include the EEG or it's in electroencephalograph, the CAT scan, computerized axial tomography, the MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, and I'm going to go over each one of these, show you some pictures, and tell you more about it. PET scan, positron emission tomography, and the functional MRI. In an EEG, electrodes are pasted onto your scalp and record electrical activity from different areas of the brain. The brain does emit, in fact, a weak electrical current. And this electrical activity is magnified and drives pens to record brain waves in an electroencephalogram that shows the brain waves. Nowadays, it's all done through computers. In a CAT scan, you lie on a table like this and you slide into what looks like a donut ring and the machine literally shoots x-rays through your head from different angles and it constructs a three-dimensional picture of the brain. Here is a cross-sectional image of a normal CAT scan contrasted with an abnormal CAT scan. In an MRI, you lie in a, again, you go on a table inside this chamber. Now, this is much bigger than a donut ring. And instead of x-rays shooting your, through your head, you're exposed to radio waves. Those of you who have had an MRI were probably surprised at how loud and noisy it can be they're continually rotating these magnets to do their job. And notice how an MRI can produce a much clearer and sharper detailed image of the brain than with a CAT scan. That's another advantage. A PET scan captures images of both structure and function. Now, this is something as far as function that the other technologies can't do. Only the PET scan and moving forward can do that. And it can map blood flow and oxygen use throughout the brain. These different colors represent glucose activity in three separate brains. I have stood beside neurologists and radiologists in the hospital as they look at reams of EEG paper and CAT scans and MRI scans and it is amazing how they can just look at it and within seconds begin to form diagnostic impressions. Of course they've gone to school and trained for many many years so maybe that's no surprise is it? The human body consists of many different types of specialized cells that organize into tissue. These tissues organize into organs and organs organize into systems. The cells that we're most interested in as psychologists is the neuron. They come in all different sizes and shapes and 
This is an artist's rendering of what one of these cells might look like. Neurons are messenger cells and they conduct impulses through the nervous system so the brain can carry out mental processes and behaviors. How many neurons do you have? Billions and billions, maybe as many as stars in our own Milky Way galaxy. The most important structures of a neuron include the dendrites, cell body, an axon, and a synapse. The branch-like structures called dendrites receive messages from nearby neurons. The cell body, with its nucleus, is the command and control center of a neuron. The axon is a whip-like thread. It's what gives the axon its length, and it sends messages to adjacent neurons. By the way, axons can be several feet long. Now, it may come as a surprise to you that with billions of neurons and trillions of possible connections, these neurons amazingly do not touch one another. An axon does not touch nearby dendrites. Instead, a message is deposited into a tiny fluid space between these neurons called a synapse. Think of it as a very small swimming pool. More about that later. We have three basic types of neurons, sensory, motor, and the inner neuron. A sensory neuron picks up information from the five senses, everything you can taste, touch, smell, feel, and hear, and it carries it up and into the brain and the brain makes a decision and a motor neuron takes information down and out from the brain to the muscles to cause behavior such as picking up a glass in this picture. Inner neurons carry information between neurons in the brain and they act as connectors. It is important to remember that this is a one-way street with the sensory and the motor neurons. A sensory neuron can only carry information up and into the brain and a motor neuron can only carry information down and out. That's the way it works. This is the end of part one. Pick us up on part two. See you then. Bye-bye.